Talking of which, you're off on holiday. <laughs> well, I am, yes. So please don't burgle my house, listeners. <laughs> Andrew. It's the Showstopper podcast. Woohoo! The musical theatre comedy improv podcast where we get to speak to people from all over the industry and get to know how they're doing. And we are somewhat broken as people right now, aren't we, Ali? Yeah, we're both shattered souls, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> we have just returned home to our respective homes uh, from the 2023 Edinburgh Fringe Festival, where we did a month full of Showstopper shows oh. uh, and had a great time. Yeah, we really did. And also saw some saw some incredible theatre whilst we were there. Really inspiring stuff. If you haven't been to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, mm. please do put it on your bucket list because it is truly a, an experience that every human needs to have. Absolutely, absolutely. It is amazing. Uh, what was your top pick of uh, setting that we performed at uh, this Edinburgh Festival, Ellie? Well, it was one that I watched, actually, which was ah. the Magaluf show. Right. Um, I, I just really love watching Showstoppers so much. Yeah. And um, and it was just it was brilliant, and it was about uh, some stags, um, uh, some hens, and some stags and their mums <laughs> and their relationships. And it was just it was absolutely hilarious and very very moving. I loved it. Well, I can't really comment because I didn't watch that one and I wasn't in it. Sure. <laughs> um, which is probably why you liked it so much. I doubt that because every time I've seen you play a mum, it's been excellent. Uh, <laughs> I did play Pam Ann the. 1970s foremost air hostess trainer in one show. There's nothing I I love more than the costume you put together for yourself backstage, Andrew. It's just so adorable. I love it. My top pick, sort of a moment rather than a whole show, but was in the show, the setting of which was extraordinary. It was the projector that creates the northern lights, oh, something along those lines. What it a show. Like a, a conspiracy theory uh, where some people behind the scenes had sort of machinery and gubbins to create the northern lights. And right at the end of the show, after everything had gone wrong and we were sort of finding our way towards, uh, you know, a new beginning, the... Uh, I think it started spontaneously, didn't it? Some of the audience put the torches on their phones and started waving them and it sort of caught on. Yeah. And we found a moment to then kind of encourage the rest of the audience <laughs> to do it. And then uh, during the closing number, just it seemed like everybody, certainly the vast majority of the audience, were just waving their torches in the air. And from our point of view, who knows, it probably didn't look like much from their point of view but from our point of view it was absolutely amazing the entire <laughs> audience like waving their lights and becoming the northern lights yeah. at the end of the show we had the best view in the house it's like being some sort of pop star wasn't it you know at Wembley yeah. like these 700 phone lights yeah it was a really moving moment absolutely you know what else is exciting Mm. This month's guest on the Showstopper podcast. Isn't she just? What a superstar. We're so lucky to be able to work with Christina Bianco. Absolutely. She's amazing. You may know her not only from her amazing performances in shows in the West End and the world generally, um, but also as a woman of a thousand voices because she's an amazing uh, impressionist. She does all those videos where she sings one song but changes through, you know, hundreds of different uh, divas uh, while she sings it. At the time of recording, she was playing Glinda in The Wizard of Oz uh, at the Palladium. Uh, she's been in Funny Girl in Paris. She's done all kinds of amazing things and she is uh, amazingly talented. There were a couple of genuine times in the room where our jaws were on the floor. It was just yeah. mind-blowing, the level of uh, talent, it, just in terms of her impersonations, let alone her amazing singing voice, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. Listen out for her Bernadette Peters uh, in this episode because it is, I just uh, just remember being completely floored by it. If you're listening and you don't know what Bernadette Peters sounds like when singing, now's a good moment to pause this podcast, have a listen to some Bernadette Peters and then pick it up again so that you're suitably impressed when it happens. Yeah, that's a great tip. What's your favourite Bernadette Peters performance, by the way, Andrew? Oh gosh, I mean that that is a tough question. Uh, I think probably the classic, just her as the witch in, in Into the Woods and that yeah. classic Broadway DVD, she's just unmatchable. Yeah, that was that was truly amazing, wasn't it? And do you remember her as Lily St. Regis in Annie in the movie? Oh was it gosh, Tim Curry? yes. She's such a chameleon, isn't she? As is Christina. Yeah, absolutely. We recorded this episode backstage before one of our West End gigs back in July, I think. And in the room chatting to us, not just on keys, but also part of the chat, uh, was one of our showstopper MDs, Jordan Clark. Let's have a listen. <laughs> Hey, 
is Christina Bianco. Welcome. Hello. I'm so happy to be here. Thank yes. you. Yes. At Welcome. long last. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great to have you. How how are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. We've had it's such a it seemed like an, an eternal rehearsal period for uh, the Wizard of Oz mm. at the In which Palladium. you were playing Glinda. Yes, much to everybody's shock. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, really, Glinda? What? Or I should say, really, Glinda? <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's funny. You know, the, the show is is so cool. It, it's um, the reason it was such a long took such a long time to rehearse is because it is so. Um, technically intense uh, and not just with screens and and uh, you know props and set pieces and all that and pyro and all those goodies but also in the many many uh, costume changes and just also in the Palladium itself it's this massive show but backstage uh, and the wing space is actually not very large so mm-hmm. there's so uh-huh. much choreography going on behind the scenes so it's a very long tech period but it's such a beautiful show and yeah going back to why people are like what you're, you're Glinda it's I would say it's not your mama's Wizard of Oz I mean mm-hmm. it's the beautiful um MGM music and story you know from the movie. And of course, we know that it wasn't first. The book was first, but we all know the movie. <laughs> so this honors the movie, but um, it has um, new songs by Andrew Lloyd Webber and uh, a slightly updated take. It's not set now. You know, it's it's still... Um, it's still got all the pieces that you know and love. We're not we're not playing with it too much, but it's a little bit modern and and it's great. The audiences love it. Some of the press is like, "Oh, it's so woke," which is hilarious, uh, wow. absolutely hilarious. Uh, uh. When it's a fantasy, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you wow. want to know what they say? All press is good press, and nobody has uh, had anything but wonderful things to say uh, coming. So it's been exhausting but thrilling, really. It genuinely has. I'm having the time of my life being a uh, sort of like a Penelope pit stop meets Barbie. Oh, cool. Meets, yes. um, some sort of, um, what is that little princess in Super Mario Brothers? Like, that's a sort of what I'm like. Yes, yeah. that's pretty much me as Glinda. I, the opposite I, of the dark hair and black t shirt New Yorker you're having. Firstly, right I, I right need now. to go, like, right now, just Su- based on that description. Super Mario alone. fan in the house oh, here. Time. Jordan Several, Clark, I showstopper. Think, absolutely. Yeah. Big time. But also, I, I can't believe there was surprise at your casting when I heard you oh, playing Glinda. I was like, yes, that yeah. is casting. I you was know, so excited about that. I think it comes with. The little thing that a lot of people know me from, you know, not necessarily doing shows, they know me from internet and then videos of me doing impressions. And when you hear someone do multiple voices, uh, and or even anyone, if you watch them play multiple characters, I think we all sort of go, well, I really think they're best doing that, or I'm more comfortable seeing them doing yeah. this. And so I think a lot of people just see me different ways. Mm. And a very sarcastic, dry New Yorker, you know, is they're mm. just thinking, what? She's Glinda, you know. But it's funny, a lot of people my whole life have said, like, oh, you know, you should be in Wicked. You should definitely go for Elphaba, or you should be in Wicked. You should definitely go for Glinda. So that that in itself, I've I, I've never been in that show, and I don't think I ever will be. But no. but I do, never. I do understand that, and I do think that's probably why some people were a little confused. But you know, it's incredible. Diane Pilkington um, is playing the Wicked Witch, and she was a fabulous Glinda in Wicked. So you yeah. see, you can have it both ways. Yes, you can. And I think our show is total proof of that. Wow. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to come and see you. Yeah. Absolutely. And you say some people see you as an impersonator, an impressionist, mm-hmm. some people would see you as a, well, How do you see yourself? How would you describe yourself as a performer? I don't like to put myself in a box, you see. Uh, very good. You see, I see <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. we were all actors and we are all singers and being forced to pick genres is is something that other people do to make themselves feel better because they have to do casting and all that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't think that um, being versatile is a bad thing. Yeah. I think it, it particularly gives you a longevity and in your career and a much more interesting career so if I were I can't really pick I love to sing so I would say and it's my first love and what I kind of fell into first so I would say I'm a singer first and foremost of any kind yeah um I've always loved singing pop rock jazz I mean if I could be in any era I'd be a big band you know swing singer you know um but I I was a New Yorker that grew up singing and writing my own country music so you know you just you just do what you feel um I but I, I love being an actor and I love being in shows. So as much as I love doing concerts where I get to sing every possible style and genre and I am my own boss and it's me up there mm-hmm. running the show. Yeah. Whenever I do that, it's thrilling and it's so cool. But I also really miss being a part of a company because I love acting and I love that community and I love that um, the shared experience. Mm. And also personally not having all the pressure and weight of it being just on me. If it succeeds or if it fails, it's just on me. And that's a lot to have all the time. Um, so I just love yeah being a part of a 
company and being in, in a play or a musical, wherever they'll have me, that's a, you know, a, a group experience. So, yeah, I, I can't pick my friends. I'm very sorry, but I, I, yeah, can't, no. I simply can't choose. I can't do it. <laughs> quite right, too. And we love to embrace the versatility of performance. And yeah. what we so love in our show is, uh, yeah, it's just going wherever the moment takes us and, yeah, and celebrating that. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I've loved watching about your shows all the time when I was doing my first... Um, my first uh, years working at the Edinburgh Fringe, oh, yeah. I went right away to see Showstoppers, and I was like, "These are my people. This is this is what you know. This oh. is it. This is it." Because I just I love the spontaneity of it, and how everybody can switch characters and types, and not just you know singing vocals, but you know, changing your voice to all of a sudden go from being the auntie you know, to being the sort of person that talks like this. Like I love it so much. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The, 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 the wackier the better for me. <laughs> and Christina, do you enjoy that playing with the audience when you're in your um, cabaret mode when you're doing your one woman show because I know you have a close relationship with your pianist don't you is it Joe who you did Life of the Party with I did I did Joe Joe has abandoned us and gone to Australia so (laughs) no but no I worked with Joe Louis Robinson for quite some time and I still will when when he comes here or I go to Australia or the US so many uh, singers or musicians when they have an accompanist it's sort of open and play you Mm. know here's the music you practice it and there it is Um, but I like to have a bit of spontaneity and a bit of um, improv in my shows um, be it with impression or otherwise and uh, it's great to have musicians that can go with the flow and and very often you know people that are very married to what's on the page it's hard to break them of that habit I work with a truly brilliant infuriatingly young and brilliant um I can't just call him a accompanist, incredible orchestrator and arranger Ryan McKenzie and Ryan is was like I can't I can't, I can't work with you it, I'm too scared I'm afraid <laughs> he'd, say. he'd be like I'm afraid and, and I'm breaking him of that you know that that fear I said it's going to be great it's going to push you and now he he still gets mad at me and gives me dirty looks but he loves it and he continues to work with me because it's um, it, you know in all of live theatre even if you're doing the same script and the same show every night which of course you really don't do in Showstoppers mm. but you know it's always different depending on you how, how your day went how your co-stars you know day went but of course it's the mostly the energy and the feedback you're getting from the audience mm. whether you're breaking the fourth wall or not um, and so in my concerts uh, it's just so much fun to do that and it keeps it the same every uh, it keeps it different every night so you're not feeling like you're just on this never-ending you know mm. we- wheel of the same thing monotony when I did um just recently I did a run of concerts at the the Meunier chocolate factory they would kill me for saying concert because you know I put it together with with script and everything and they're like it's not a concert you put together a piece it's a show <laughs> so thank you David Babani it's a show um <laughs> but when I did my run of shows there um it had been a long time um it, you know post-pandemic and whatnot since I did a full run of something so we did I forgot how many but it was like you know 20 shows or, or something like that in a very short amount of time and uh, I even I thought gosh can I can I do this and not sound like I've said this 18 times before <laughs> and it's always the audience that gets me through that yeah. it always is the audience that changes my mood and that's the magic of theater as well the lights go on and you go up there go up on stage and even if I am Christina Bianco I'm not the Christina Bianco that's going to tell you oh my gosh you're not going to believe this my dog got in a fight today mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. that's got to go mm-hmm. you've got to be you know yourself but that heightened and um you know, version of yourself that's telling a different story. So uh, it's only the audience that does that. It's great to hear because your your shows are really expanding now. I think you're doing them internationally more and more. Yeah, well, right? I, and I certainly was... Um, Prior to the great, the great pandemic, um, uh, especially one of the reasons I live here now. Oh, I live here, yeah. yeah. So yes, you can definitely say I'm doing them more international. <laughs> um, yeah, we. Uh, I moved here on a visa um, about a year and a half, two years ago, and it's going really, really well. As you can see, I've been so lucky to have been been working and doing a, a fair amount, a mix of you know plays and 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 straight plays, musical theater, and uh, my own concerts. So so far, so good. It's lovely. I just you know. When you have the opportunity to travel, um, I always say, take it. And if you're an artist, really do, because it, you can only learn and you can only um, get better by having you know, more varied and interesting life experience. So I just can't get enough yeah. of it, yeah. And it was just, it was just difficult always traveling uh, away from the States. And mm-hmm. after a while, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm working more internationally than I am in the right. States. And, and I kept wanting to take advantage of these, these opportunities. And I thought, 
I never want to wonder what if anymore. So mm. let's just bite the bullet and move. And sometimes it takes a big life change to make you go, I'm not going to wait anymore. I'm just mm. going to do it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So if anything good can come out of that dark period we all had, mm-hmm. it was that I just decided to bite the bullet and, um, and right. move over here. And I'm so glad that I did. I've had such a miserable experience. What do I want? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's true. And so many people are always, particularly in the arts in general, not just the performing arts, our work is not consistent. So having yeah. a pause in our work is not something we're all, you know, sure. very few yeah. people have no pauses. Bless them, lucky yeah. for them. Mm. But, you know, it, it was something that we're used to those ebbs and flows. Mm. And I just think that it, it's just, when you say to yourself, well, how bad could it be? Well, we found out how bad it could be. So then you go, well, if I got through that, I can certainly take this, take this risk and see where it leads me. And on the uh, international front, you were recently Fanny Bryce in Funny Girl in in Paris. The greatest job of my life. (laughs) It really was. It really was. And it sounds so funny. I mean, honestly, I could talk about it forever. I won't. Uh I won't. I promise. Please do. I can just twist my arms a little bit. (laughs) No, the reason it was so cool and uh, just saying it, you did Fanny Bryce and Funny Girl in Paris. So I did this fabulous production that um, was an an entire... um, British cast and and a mostly creative team um, led by the brilliant Stephen Muir, director, choreographer. Everyone knows him uh, as a brilliant choreographer, but he is an equally brilliant director. And I'm still waiting for the day they give him a chance to do that mm. in the West End. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's is really underappreciated as a director. Um, the reason this production was so loved is genuinely because of him. He assembles the best team and it's just, everybody got along and it was so beautiful. So you've got this British um, creative team and cast um, and then you have the brilliant French Jean-Luc Chaplin, the artistic director, uh, who has been the brain the brainchild of, you know, American in Paris and all that. Like mm. he has brilliant ideas and just isn't afraid to take these risks. And he said, well, we need to do more you know, theater in Paris, let's bring the show here. Ask Stephen, loves working with him. And I'm this random American <laughs> in the show. So I'm an American in a cast full of British people, all trying to talk with a New York accent. <laughs> and of course, backstage you're talking like this. And then of course we have the, uh, the crew and the, uh, the wiggies. You say, uh, you cannot do this, you must do that. Da, da, da. So it was so weird that anybody from the States that came to see the show and I talked to them afterwards, like your accent's weird, Christina. I was like, I don't know where I am. I don't know where I am. But it was incredible. And then you're doing it for an audience. This is this show uniquely about you know, New York and yeah. a, a famous, you know, mm. New Yorker uh, to an audience where a lot of the audience doesn't even speak English. So we would do the show as written, but there were um, screens with subtitles, much uh, like yeah, when you go see yeah. an opera on the side of the stage. So it was really fun because you would, you know, do something funny. Hey, it's funny, girl. And it gets a laugh. But on sh- and a lot of it is the timing and the pacing <laughs> and the pushing it, you know. And you will hear a laugh right when you expect it. But then you'll also hear... <laughs> a laugh a little bit later when they read it and they yeah. understand it. So yeah. it was Great. so cool. Like and I think because, and you know that, and, and this is me, absolutely, I have no comment on any of the other f- funny girl stories going on in the world and Broadway and the sure, productions and all enough. that. All no, I'll tell you is we hit something really, really special. I've never been a part of anything that was so unanimously well-received and well-reviewed yeah. internationally. Yeah. And when the New York Times comes and gives you your whole show, an incredible rave like that, I just thought, oh my God, like this was supposed to be a short little run in Paris. And then it was extended and then it became something that even the States, you know, took a, took an interest in. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and I just, I thought, wow, this is something that would, they can never take away from me. Like it was this cool, incredible experience. And yes, there was talk of bringing it other places, doing more with it, but the great pandemic stepped in. We closed, after our extension, we closed on March 7th. Uh, I left Paris March 9th and then everything shut down by the 12th. Yeah, so it was, nice. I mean, the timing was, the fact that we were able to finish it yeah, was so wow. incredible. But I will tell you, going from being sort of like the toast of Paris <laughs> and, you know, performing to, you know, two balconies full of people cheering and, you know, like sipping Sancerre on the Seine and immediately to lockdown was quite a shock mm-hmm. to the system God, yeah. and plunged me into probably the greatest darkest little depression of my life. And I'm someone who's, you know, spent a lot of time doing stuff on social media and Mm. and some sort of, you know, live streams and stuff like that. And so everyone expected me to jump right in and do that stuff when, when we realized entertainment had to be this, you know, virtual thing. And I didn't, I just needed some downtime. (laughs) I really did. And it was, it was so important that I take that time. But 
coming off an experience like Funny Girl, playing mm. a part that challenged me and thrilled me equally with such a great experience on stage and off and in a country where I didn't speak the language and I was terrified and they made me feel so comfortable. I do not think the French are snobs. I do not <laughs> think that they're rude. If you're rude to them, they're probably rude to you. You know, just, just it, they're just like anybody else. You, if you are your best Mm -hmm. you know, self, they're going to give that back to you. And so it was such a beautiful experience. I had to sort of let that settle (laughs) before I was like, all right, here we go. I'm going to do voices in front of this camera (laughs) awkwardly. (laughs) And it was also a thing for me because I I was so enjoying not doing impressions. I love them. I will always love doing them, but it was so important to also be me for a Mm. while. Mm -hmm. And the whole, you know, point of the character, you know, is that, you know, people see her different ways and you're not quite this, you're not quite that, you're not quite right for that. I have heard that my whole life mm-hmm. uh, and you know you're just not you're really talented but you're just not quite the right fit you're a little too this you're a little too that and I just identified with that so much and I fell in love with that character and I sort of take a piece of her everywhere I go now mm-hmm. and that was why I needed to take a little moment I was like yeah. you know what find your feet find your love for this but be true to yourself and just take yeah. a pause and- not only do you get to play that gorgeous character, but you get to sing some of the greatest songs in all of musical theatre. I mean, the yeah. list goes on. Yeah. Everyone says, what's your favorite song to sing? It's like picking, it's like Sophie's Choice. What, are yeah. you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. Don't write in my parade if you don't love singing that downstage center with the big oh, orchestra, yeah. massive oh, orchestra yeah. and the curtain yeah. falling to end the act like a diva. Oh my Lord. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've sung about the divas, I've impersonated the divas and I've sung <laughs> solos on stage my yes. whole life. But that, that was a moment I will never okay. forget. But my favorite, oh, gosh, Music that makes me dance is one of my favorite moments. That beautiful ballad, mm. and um, but I think I think I'm the greatest star. Is it's her first one mm. in the show, and I get to be wacky and, and show my colors, and that was oh gosh, I guess that might have been the best part. <laughs> but then I love singing and dancing to Cornette Man. Yes, I love that too, yes. and, and it's just it was just a dream, and. Uh, yeah, it's one of those jobs where you say to yourself, I may never get to do anything as cool as this again. <laughs> you think, I never thought I'd get to do that. Mm, so you yeah. never know never what's going to come your way. Yeah. Never. Could you give us a bit of a glimpse behind the curtain? I'd love to know, because I'm sure some of our listeners as well would love to know how you prepare for a role like that. Could you tell us maybe about, you know, what happens when you get to the theatre and just take us through the steps of getting ready to play Fanny Bryce? Sure. You mean at the, once once you're rehearsed and you're in the show? Yeah, like what the day to day of living yeah. that life is. Sure. Well, if you're in Paris, <laughs> it was even a little bit different because you're, you know, I wasn't in my own home. It's mm-hmm. like you know, you're being on tour, you know, you're traveling. So you're somewhere where you have to make yourself feel as comfortable as possible. And I say that because a great part of this industry is taking care of yourself. And if you if you're lucky enough to have a a, a role in a show that people really care about, you're also an, an equal part of your job is doing press and promotion for that show. Yeah. Yeah. So a great part of my day was making sure that even after I saw people after the show and probably went out and had a glass of champagne I probably shouldn't have had but it's part of the job you know (laughs) I would you know sleep in have lots of water but I normally had to go do some press radio interviews Mm -hmm. or stuff in person and so it's I call it a slow warm up I'm blessed with a pretty strong voice, but when you're doing eight shows a week in a very demanding sing, you never take that for granted. So I don't do a massive warm up at the top of the day or a massive warm up right before a show. Mm. I kind of do a slow little warm ups during the day. If Mm. I'm taking a shower and I steam up the room, I do my go, oh, I do lots of ooh, oh, oohs Mm. in a very resonant tone. Mm. Like I'll bust the mic if I do it full resonance now. It sounds ugly, but it feels good Mm. to go like, like that and try oh. to keep the resonance like you're creating your own whale like song in your, in your shower <laughs> How about sing? adding that, that to my resume beautiful. also does whale sounds um, <laughs> but it's, it's a very warm um, mm. easy way and also everyone knows a lip trill but I just find the ooh oh ooh is really it's helpful. I felt so the resonance sort of, over here. Yeah, thank you. Thank it. you. It <laughs> reaches across. Uh, and I'm quite husky today. So it's, it's very nice to hear that I can do it even in this vocal state. Um, but um, the, the, I find that when you, I always like to get out and walk. I'm a New Yorker. I like to walk around. That's what I love about London. And so in Paris, the city like that, I was able to do that as well. Because mm. even just walking and being out wakes you up. You walk uphill, use your breath. I, I, I definitely found that doing big vocal warmups and big physical warmups wasn't right because I could kind of peak or tire out too soon. Sure. Um, so I would go to the theater very early, typically to do some press or something. And then uh, they're very strict over there. So I would have to get my... Um, wig prep done Mm. and my microphone 
on and in my wig cap sometimes before I even went to warm up because the cast was so big. So this is now like an hour and a half before the show even starts and mm-hmm. I've already got my wig and mic on. Mm-hmm. But I thought that was actually a blessing because it gave me so much more time to not worry about that, to relax and focus. For me, this is very specific to the role of Fanny Bryce, but I'll still share it. A lot of it is getting what you know of a part or an idea of a part out of your head, right? Particularly mm. if it's a show with a revival or something mm. that's been done before based on a movie, based on a, you know, a singer is in a band. There's so many jukebox musicals. You don't want to sing it like the person who sung it before. In this case, how do you not think of Barbara Streisand? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And particularly as somebody who impersonates yeah, Barbara Streisand. <laughs> so I would go out of my way to erase that from my mind and I would... Uh, kind of review, sometimes review the songs a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I love to sing stuff that's not in the show. It's good for your voice to not get in a rut. So I always recommend singing stuff that's a different vocal style, different vocal range in the show because like anything, you can get into a routine and Mm -hmm. your voice kind of gets, I don't know, a little lazy, a little Mm -hmm. tired, a little too set in its ways. Mm -hmm. But I would always give myself a little sing of those those songs just to remind mind myself that there are other ways to sing them because Barbara likes to change the melody and ah. the you know and the length and uh, you hold notes and sometimes you fall into that you want to give the audience a little bit of what they know yeah. but not too much because I'm not here to do an impression I'm here to do what you know Julie Stein wrote it's different so I would do a little light sing of those mm-hmm. this is a very long answer that is probably not interesting <laughs> then I would very do a bit of interesting we have a company group warm up, of course, but I still do some own in my room. I love doing like more like long, lengthy stretches, like more Pilates sort of thing. Mm. I'm a four foot eleven girl, you know. I'm never going to kick to the stratosphere, so I just do my own time and my own little vocal warm up. But the other thing that I like to do, and it sounds it sounds like a little bit cheesy, but I definitely make sure that I go see the rest of the cast and mm. I check in. Even at warm up, it's hard to do that. Mm, mm. I find it so important to be present and like sort of knock on doors and say, how how y'all doing today? Get the vibe of the room, Mm. get the vibe of each other because it grounds you so much when you go on stage. Yeah. If you're, if you just like, on Broadway, they don't do that. Not just Broadway, in all of American theater. I mean, you check in a half hour, sometimes you're on that stage in costume and that's the first time you've seen someone. Mm. And now that I've done it here, a different way, it's going to be really hard to go back to that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, I, it sounds so like artsy, but like I want to make it like a shared group experience. <laughs> no, By the time you start a right show, people. like yeah, yeah, yeah if, if you start a show like that, and it's a big the role of Fanny Bryce does mm-hmm. not really leave the stage except for quick changes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Um, It's also that mental checklist of like, you know that your dressers and everybody is supposed to have that stuff ready for you, but you have to do your own check. So it's a lot of work before you hit that stage to make sure that you're prepared. Um, But by the time, let me tell you, every single time when they said, you know, beginner's call, I was absolutely ready crazy wigs on, you know, ready to go. (laughs) But it's, it's many steps of like, little bit of vocal warm up, a little bit of physical warm up. Mm. Then you do a little walking and then you do a little interview and then you do the group warm up and then you whatever. But it, it's 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 lengthy and you do like, it's like well, that's sort of a lot of your day. Well, it is because mm, that yeah. is my one and only important job. Mm, mm. Um, so it was, yeah, I don't even know that really answered your question, but I certainly talked for eight minutes there, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> so interesting yeah. just to have an insight into the life of a leading lady. But I think, yeah. you know, especially the checking in with your company and making yeah. sure you've seen those people's faces That's before important you see them to in me. role. It's very important That's to important us as to well me. in Showstopper. Yes. You know, it's yeah. the foundation of our show in many ways that we connect with each other so that we can then play with each other and really, ha- you know, know that when we get on stage, that's definitely not the first time we've seen each other because we've spent yeah. the day connecting. We couldn't, we couldn't do it, could we? We couldn't just just see each other for the first time on stage. I don't We'd think, just be all at sea. And I know some people do that. And I'm also not trying to say, like, I know there are no, some no. people that also aren't aren't really that lovely to work with who are great at their jobs that maybe aren't the greatest to be in a show with. And, yeah. you know, those people exist, but I'd go out of my way to try to not be that sort of person. And, and one of the biggest compliments I ever got in my life, and I remember I was surprised someone said it to me because I was like, what? I was doing this production of Joseph in um, Chicago and I was the narrator and, you know, there's a Joseph and there's now it doesn't seem like the narrator is the lead of the show. She sings, but you know, to me it's Joseph's show and all that. And so I was just doing my job every day, just doing my job. And uh, the this is the dance captain came over to me and she said, Christina, I just want to thank you. You've been such a great leader. And I went, hmm. what? Leader, <laughs> but she said, "Oh, you just you just check in with everybody, and you're so present. You make sure everybody's on the same page." And when she said that to me, I honestly didn't know that what I was doing was. Uh, I don't know, I guess noticed or that it was sometimes sadly rare. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Once she said that, I was like, then I'm going to keep 
doing that sort of thing. And it just makes me more aware that particularly if you are, um, it's a blessing and the curse of having sometimes the weight of a show on you. But when you've got kind of the weight of the show on you, there are so many things to do. And like I said, lots and lots of press and things like that mm-hmm. and little last minute things. Mm-hmm. Or someone's coming to the show, could you meet them mm-hmm. afterwards and whatever? And you have to make a little note of the names of the people. I, have, I had a note pad on my desk that was for like, friends of mine that were coming, press that was coming, or um, you know, indus- industry, somebody I had to meet after the show. Mm-hmm. It's something you also have to remember. Mm-hmm. And so the one thing that I was like, never let it go is my own self-care, but also the, the company vibe. Because it just takes, if, it's like a domino effect. Like if mm-hmm. one person yes. falls, mm-hmm. it can all go down real fast. So you gotta be a nice unit. Absolutely. Going back in time now. Yes. Um, when, when did you discover that you had this talent for being in a woman of a thousand voices? <laughs> Um, uh, my parents knew I had it before I did. It was came uh, very naturally to me. Yeah. So I was just like a natural little mimic, but I never did it to get a laugh. I mean, I, I embellish a story a little bit when I do my shows because you have to sort of obviously tell a story and make it a little more mm. succinct and clear. But it was it was actually quite some time until I was like, oh my gosh, hey, I, I want to hear something. I can do that, you know. I was um, at a party. Um, junior high, I think. And the song, um, Celine Dion's song, That's the Way It Is, came on. And I remember that I had sort of cracked my mom up in the car doing a little mm. Celine, like, that's the way it is, you know, just just <laughs> even just the pronunciation of it, but then singing like her. And my mom was like, oh, you sound like her when you do that. So I was at the party and again, Husky right now, it's not going to be a great impression, but I was like, you know, um, don't give up on your faith. Love comes to those who believe it. And that's the way it is. That's the way it is. And I was just doing it lightly at the party. And someone was like, oh my God, everybody come over here. Let's never see that do this. And all of a sudden there was this group of people just like staring at me, <laughs> eyes right on me. And I was like, oh, this wow. is something that people like to hear. And I didn't think, and I shall make a profession out of yeah, it. Like, yeah. Absolutely not. Um, but it was something I, I really was like more like a party trick. Yeah. Um, and I was always, you know, I'm outgoing by nature. Like I, I like to talk people, talk to people and I'm not afraid in, in social situations to, to do something. When it comes to performing, even if we were at karaoke at like, or, or at a restaurant and there happened to be some karaoke, my mom would say like, oh, Christina, get up and sing. I'd be like, absolutely not. Like it, there needs to be, I need to be in, invited by the person running the event or it right. needs to be something where I'm not <laughs> looking like, look at me. I, if I'm on stage, no fear. Mm-hmm. But if there's no stage, I'm not gonna stand up and pull focus. Yeah. Part of me thinks maybe I would've been more successful in my life if I was a little more like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but when it came to the impressions, it was something that I knew I could use. Like, oh, this is good. I can change my voice to sound like other people. I knew that I could do kids and I knew that I could do old ladies. Like I knew I could do these voices. I thought, okay, help me as an actor. I could do some voiceover work. Mm. Um, so that's where I thought I could apply it. Um, and it just took experience and meeting more people and doing, I remember Kristen Chenoweth got very famous and as a fellow four foot 11 woman, as I say, a mm-hmm. member of the 411, <laughs> um, I thought it was fun to try to talk like her and everyone thought, oh my goodness, that's so funny. <laughs> you know, you sound like her. And so I, I made a little list of these impressions that I could do. Amazing. Not really knowing ever what I would do with it. And then one day, um, the uh, you know, in, in America, there's a Backstage magazine, which has all mm. of the um, auditions for people that are in or not in the union. And uh, this was like, you know, union auditions, Forbidden Broadway. Forbidden Broadway, the long running off Broadway show. Yeah. Uh, such such a cult favorite that lovingly spoofs and pokes fun of all the Broadway shows. And of course, did it in the West End. I was lucky enough to do it here. So it made it so popular, it made its way to, to London and other international cities. Um, I grew up literally like came out of the womb listening to these mm-hmm. cast albums. Mm-hmm. My parents always liked it. I went to see the show as a kid. Uh, with every changing season, they would do changing albums and for the listeners that don't know. And the, they would cover um, Broadway celebrities from back in the day like Julie Andrews and Barbara Streisand to more contemporary stars like Kristen Chenoweth, Adina Menzel, you know, Kelly O'Hara and, and the like. And... Um, I just thought, oh my gosh, just two men and two women historically have done the show, playing essentially every single character in all of theater and some pop culture people thrown in if it was topical. And you didn't have to do impressions, but all the best numbers, if you, you know, you knew they were gonna hire people that could do impressions. Mm -hmm. And they finally had auditions, like an open call. And the show had been running at that point about 28 years. I'm pretty sure they had a big stable of people. I'm sure it was a required open call yeah. for the yeah. union. And I thought, you know what though? I'm going to go. I, I can change my voice. I, I wouldn't be embarrassing if I went to this. And uh, I went in 
And I decided, they said, if you have impressions, it's a, it'd be like a bonus. And I was like, okay. So I said, Bernadette Peters, I could do a good Bernadette Peters. And I could do, I had a little post-it note that I kept in my trousers. I know I should have worn a dress, but I wore trousers. <laughs> um, I was trying to be all anti-girly at that point, you know, be a little more flexible. Like, hey, I'm artsy, I can do this. And uh, I genuinely, I think about it, I was wearing these big baggy black trousers. I don't know what's wrong with me. And uh, I sang my, my, my two audition songs. Oh, did you happen to do any impressions? I was like, yes, of course. It's like saying you ride horseback when you don't. You <laughs> yeah. know? And I remember I sang a bit of Bernadette Peters singing Joanna because I loved her going, I feel you, Joanna. And uh, uh, that's what they did. And uh, they laughed behind the table. Uh, and uh, I got a call back. And they said, bring in all your impressions. And I was like, oh, my God. So I went back and I listened to all of Forbidden Broadway cast albums again and made my list of those numbers that I knew and and tried to bring some, some new ideas. And uh, they really weren't looking to cast anyone. But they ended up casting me and putting me right in the New York production. Oh, wow. Before I knew it, I was reviewed well in the New York Times. I got a Drama Desk Award nomination. And I was invited to do impressions all over New York City at concerts, at events, at benefits, and at the Friars Club, the big comedy. And I was like, wow. what happened? So when I say, although I was doing impressions a little bit my whole life, it was about 2008, and I was just thrown wow. into it. So it was like, it was, you know, 20... 26 or whatever years of prep at that point, but it yeah. was like, or 20, how old was I? You know, it was just, it was something that I really didn't take ownership of until someone said, you can do this. I'd like to see you do this. And mm. once I got that though, I worked so hard because I thought, well, you can't just do forbidden Broadway material. It's not applicable. Mm. And if you can do Brennan at Peters, you can do Gwen Stefani. Like the placement is similar. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, Brennan at Peters is this. But I'm Gwen Stefani is here. <laughs> you know, so I was like, you have to find this way to do that. And so I ended up expanding it and expanding it. And the fact that I ever had, you know, a YouTube video, let alone three, go viral when that was the thing, yeah. um, yeah. is in incredible. And then also the fact that they were like, oh, she started this trend. You know who started the trend of taking one song and singing it as multiple contemporaries and multiple celebrities? Sammy Davis Jr. Uh -huh. And that's yeah. what I listened to growing up. So all of my nerdy little <laughs> things I did as a little kid all paid off. I uh, showed up a cast member, Jonathan Ainsco, who's very sad he's not here because he's a massive, massive fan of music. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, but he wanted us to ask on his behalf, when you're approaching uh, an impersonation, to what extent is it like an instinctive process? And to what extent are you thinking like really technically about your placement and and all of the sort of musculature? Yeah, that, that it involves? depends on the person. It depends on the voice. I mean, some voices singing and speaking come much more easily to me than others. And some voices I hear and I go... Oh, there it is. Like Catherine Parkinson is one of my favorite British impressions yeah. to do. It, it, just a, a wonderful, great actor. I used to say comedic actress, but certainly she does everything. And her voice is so specific to me. It's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit covered. It's a bit soft. In fact, I don't like to do it at the end of a show because I actually have to. I'm realizing as I go on shows that doing that to my vocal cords is actually putting the breath behind it. It's quite difficult. It feels easy, but it's not. So I learn now do that earlier in a show because your voice is too tired by yeah. the end to do that um i was watching like binge watching the it crowd and just started talking as her <laughs> my husband was like home from work and i was like darling what do you want for dinner i quite fancy a pizza like and he was just like what are you doing and i was like I, i'm stuck in this voice and i can't get out um but then and someone like a uh, karen walker the character from will and grace if you can do Kristen chenoweth you could probably do karen right, walker right. honey she's all here and she's so funny you know like you know, all those little voices those I found that place right away but there are some people you just go that's a unique sound how do I do that and you play around and you do it trial and error you get it wrong um, there are a lot of people that are their voices are not like my own at all and that's mm. when I have to think more technically mm. Once you find it and play, because then it's the more different from your voice, the more dangerous it could be. Yeah. And there are lots of people that I'm requested to do and could have been paid good money to do, you know, for voice matching or whatever. And I go, you know what? I'm just not, I'm going to say no, because I, I also want to sing and I also want to sing as Christina. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find your limits. Like, why don't you do Tina Turner? I, if I'm ill, I do a great Tina Turner. Sure. You know, like, if I'm <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great. Totally yeah. yeah, like when I do... Um, Liza Minnelli. And everything for me is I start with I start with the voice, um, and then once I get more comfortable with the voice, then I try to add the physicality. But And usually I start with something they have said or something that they have sung. Mm. And then once I feel com like I've mastered a few of those, then I branch out and think about how they would sound or uh, approach something they haven't 
yeah. song or mm-hmm. haven't read. That's what that's part of you know what I love to do is mix and match. So have Liza Minnelli do something mm-hmm. crazy she's never done, like live in La Vida Loca. Although she's sung everything, as I say, you have to work really hard to find something because she <laughs> even did single ladies and made it work. Um, <laughs> But, you know, for, for Liza, Liza has a voice that's very, a wider vibrato than mine. Mm-hmm. Mine's pretty, pretty normal speed, ah, which is more like maybe Celine Dion speed. Mm-hmm. But Liza's is wider. Ah, it's always been uh-huh. slower yeah. and more in the back of her throat. Mm-hmm. And as she got older, the grit, the grit started to creep in. So you get, ha ah, and so you want to do a little bit of this, but of course that is vocal fry. Tiring, so you yeah. have to place it in a way that's safe. Yeah. So that's when I start thinking, really support, really go wide. And so I do a lot of loud Liza as opposed to softer Liza because I can support it more, which means I'm more open and more right. resonant and safer. Wow. Stuff like that, oh, yeah. I have so much admiration for how much you know your instrument. It's so impressive. Well, I think you know. I think it's also important for people out there. I know people, there's so many trends. When I was first doing impressions, <laughs> you know, gosh, nobody <laughs> was doing it. And they always say like, I started, YouTube always says like the algorithm, like I'm the one that started the trend of doing multiple impressions. like in one song or in one video. And I think that's hysterical because I don't have that many views. Like today, you look at, if you type in impression videos or one girl, 20 voices, and these videos have like 18 million views on one thing. And I think I have like, you know, 30 million on collectively or something like that. But what I did was get coverage, media coverage, TV, radio, print. And that wouldn't happen today. Now Mm. it's all about the views, but it doesn't really lead to anything. So I was very lucky, Mm. as I say. But with that luck, I was then prepared. And this goes back to what you said, which is, you know, um, you know, how you approach it is like I approached it all not as someone who was like, I want to do impressions. I approached it as somebody who loved to sing and loved to do voices. So I already knew my own voice. I've always studied voice and I've always known how to sing as Christina. I could not do these impressions, I think, as well as I do them. And I've been getting, I think I'm much better now than I was. I go back and watch those videos and I'm mortified of how bad I think those impressions are (laughs) because you do improve like anything, you know. And so I do them more safely and I think I do them better because I know my own voice. And along with that, I knew how to craft a show. I knew how to craft a cabaret. I had done concerts um, in New York on a small scale. So when you perform on the Ellen DeGeneres show and then big companies call you and say, do you have a show? I say, yes, I do. Do you want it for the piano? Do you want it with three pieces or do you want it with seven? And how long do you want it? Mm. And then I wasn't just the YouTube sensation like Charlie bit my finger. Then I could take that... I could take that, um, you know, uh, well, let's say platform and actually add it to what I do in my career already. And that was just something, again, that is today doesn't happen as often because it's all about the internet and the instant gratification. But I think one of the reasons I, and I can definitely tell you this, one of the reasons I even booked Fanny Bryce and Funny Girl is because Stephen Meir and a lot of people here in the UK saw my videos and were sharing them in the theater scene. And they didn't just say, oh, she does voices and turn off the thing, turn off you know, their device. They went, oh, she does all those voices. She must be a fairly decent singer in her own right and remembered my name and then came to see me in concert. And then Stephen knew I could carry a show and be funny and sing and that's what got me in the room for him a few times and then ultimately led me to playing Fanny Bryce for him. So it, it's all connected, you know. Don't listen to the people and actors. <laughs> yes. Actors, young and old. I mean, I had to deal with this myself, particularly in New York, and I'm just being honest about that. I have a wonderful agent here in the UK and the difference is that I've kept for years as opposed to switching agents a lot in the States. And that's because that particular agent believed in me and said everything I do is connected. And don't listen to the people that tell you that if you do something in dance, it's not necessarily going to help you in theater. Or if you mm. do something mm. in musical theater, it's not necessarily going to help you in television. Be your best, be true to yourself, and work begets work, and connections beget connections. So just keep it going. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I, I mean, that to me sounds like the perfect summing up and the point at which we might move on to our next bit, which is improvising a song. How does that make you feel, Christina? It makes me absolutely terrified, but I think we've already established that you've got to do some things uh, that scare you. You've got to take a risk and see where it takes you. So let's find out let's how us. I am at this. <laughs> let's do it. I'd love to see a duet. What's the duet about? Could it be a couple moving overseas, oh. starting a new chapter? Wow, oh, yeah, sure. okay, okay. Here we go. Uh, that's, uh, that's the last box. 
Are we really going to do this? I, you know what? I think we are. Taking chances. Moving on. Feeling. What am I doing? Yeah. But it's a feeling that's strong. Packing boxes. Hiring cars. We're really going to do it. Yeah. I just want to be with you. It doesn't matter where And wherever the path leads You know I'll be there And I care You care We're going across the world To find ourselves We're going across the world To find who we are. We're, We're going, going across, across the world, world to find ourselves. New going going across, across the world, world to find out who we are. And sure, we'll miss the Joneses at number 42 and that cat who always gets into our yard. But we'll love the new skyline and the new pubs. Yeah. There's always something new out there. And as long as you're with me as the sun sets in the sky. I know anything we try will succeed. Anything. Though it's scary, we can be anything. As long as you're with me, and you're with me, then we'll find out. We'll find out who we are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Christina, thank you so much. So, so much fun chatting with you today. Thank you so much for having me. Do you have anything you'd like to plug? Yes, of course. Well, please do come see um, me as Glinda and the fabulous company uh, at the Wizard of Oz at the Palladium. We run until September 3rd. But I do have to say I'm very excited. Not long after that, September 16th in Brighton. And if you're thinking, I don't live in Brighton, it's a great place to come visit or spend the mm. night and we'll get you on your last train home. September 16th, I am headlining the big concert, Liza with a Z and more with the 28 piece London Gay Big Band. Oh, We're doing man. all of Lies with a Z and more to make your <laughs> evening a little lengthy with fabulous dancers and special guests. Suze Kempner will be there. It's going to be just this, I call it the event of the season, really. It uh, it's when do you get the chance to hear a big band like that doing all the great songs um, from, you know, Kander and Ebb songs, um, from Cabaret and whatnot. So many great hits. And honestly, it's a thrill of my life. I will throw in Eliza Minnelli impression, but I do get to do the show mostly is me. So I'm living my big band dreams. September 16th, come see us, please. Amazing. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> That was Christina Bianco. Oh, what a woman. Supremely talented in all areas. It was really fun singing that song with her. Yeah, it was a beautiful one, Andrew. It had sort of Dear Evan Hansen vibes, I thought. Very contemporary yeah. sounding. Such a fun episode and really looking forward to the next few months with Showstopper. Some exciting things happening. Yes, absolutely. We are back on the road. No sooner have we finished at the Edinburgh Festival, we're touring again. So if you live in places like Kingston or Poole or Hornchurch or Cambridge, where we're doing a three-day run, uh, then you can come and see us live 
go to the website showstoppertheMusical.com for tickets. We love our autumn tour. There's such a nice vibe on the road when we're out in the autumn, I think. Everyone is post to Edinburgh. The show feels super connected and we've had such an amazing kind of um, run of shows so everyone's feeling really present and the show just feels so alive I think in the autumn yeah you love an autumn tour don't you I do you're always saying every time we get to the spring tour you're like I hate the spring <laughs> I can't stand the new shoots of life and the, the sunshine <laughs> and the warming up I can't stand this weather take me back to the autumn <laughs> That's right I like the, the leaves falling from the trees because I find it very poetic which helps with yeah. the lyrics Absolutely. And and it suits your, you know, downcast, melancholy personality. <laughs> I'm summer incarnate. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Uh, you can check us out on all of the usual social platforms, uh, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Insta. Just search for us is the easy way. Also, we're on threads, although I'll be honest, I don't post that much there because um, it's quite you can't schedule things. It's quite annoying. Talking of which, you've already started putting out some of the awesome entertaining videos that we made in Edinburgh. It's a conveyor belt of entertaining content. It's a conveyor belt of brilliance. Philip sang this amazing song. Do you remember the Red Bear song? Oh yeah! What a look what out a for it! <laughs> look out for it! We were doing a little little promo record, and Phil asked for a couple of words, and he got the words "bear" and "red," and then sang this awesome, like really detailed, like comic book superhero narrative about Red Bear, the communist superhero from the nineteen sixties. Like absolutely, inc- how that stuff comes out of his brain is just uh, incredible. Yeah, improv is just amazing, as is. Phil Pellew, absolutely, absolutely incredible mind. Brilliant improviser. Catch him in the show. Absolutely. All right, Andrew. Well, catch you next month. Bye. Bye. <laughs>